It's spring 1903 in Salonika. It's a night in the town with your loved one. You catch an evening show at the local theater. All is well. Then suddenly, you hear a faint boom. And before you know it, you're plunged into darkness. Then, another louder explosion rocks the entire room. Outside, you hear a loud commotion, even some gunfire. The Salonika assassins have just begun their raid on the city. What happens next? Well, let's find out. You're watching Mario's History Talks. I'm Mario Rostovsky, and let's get started. By the spring of 1903, Macedonia was ripe for revolution. Ilinden, as well as the hope of independence from Macedonia from the Ottomans, was just around the corner, or so it seemed. However, a group of young and impatient Macedonians sought to take the independence of Macedonia into their own hands. They called themselves the Gemiji, which is Turkish for boatmen, because they were constantly leaving behind everyday life and the limits of the law to sail with a boat into the free and wild seas of lawlessness. The group consisted of about 10 conspirators, mainly from Veles, but all young, mostly between the ages of 18 and 21. They were Jordan Popirodanov, Kosta Din Kirko, Milan Arso, Dimitar Meche, Georgi Bogdanov, Ilya Trchkov, Vladimir Pinkov, Marko Boshnakov, Trajko Cvetkov, and Pavel Shatov. All these men were youthful, hot-headed, ethno-nihilists with a fervent and unyielding love for Macedonia. They were extreme individualists, guided by a philosophy of nihilism and a morbid desire to die young for Macedonia at any costs. In fact, the leader of their group, Orce Popirodanov, was so devoted to his nihilistic outlook that he refused to have any photographs of him taken. Not expecting to live long, he didn't want anything permanent of himself to remain. And this impatience and hot-headedness often clashed with the Central Committee of Vamorov. They often pleaded with them to delay their attacks, if not outright cancel them. But for the Gemiji, their answer, as well as their fates, was sealed. There was no turning back. Sekolnam. Sekolnam. Ia Sekolnam. Ia Sekolnam. Sekolnam Ias. Ias. Sekolnam. By 1902, the Gemiji were well underway planning their attack. Ideologically, they were descended from the earlier Macedonian Secret Revolutionary Committee, so it was only fitting they pick up and carry on their goals that were left unfinished. Literally, part of their plans was to strike the Ottoman bank of Salonika with dynamite. This is the same bank the previous group tried to hit in 1900 before they were discovered and caught by the Ottomans. So, the Gemiji purchased a store right across the street. They converted it into a grocery store, and they begin the slow and arduous work of tunneling underneath to connect to the original tunnel, which in turn connected them to right underneath the bank. Now, as for the Ottomans, they were warned that anarchists may be planning some explosions in the area. So what did they do? They just posted more guards around high target buildings, completely oblivious as to what was happening right below their feet. Not just this, but the Gemiji planned to strike other targets strategically. Their overall goal was to shock the West back into coherence, to see the plight and suffering of Macedonians, but also to come and finally intervene on Macedonia's behalf. By the spring of 1903, their plans were set. They managed to acquire 160 kilograms of dynamite from various networks and sources. This wasn't nearly enough to hit multiple cities as they had planned originally, that was okay. They were completely content with Salonika being their stage and their coffin. It was Easter weekend when their preparation for their attacks was finally done. And on their last few days on Earth, they finally let go of their strict and austere, Spartan-like lifestyle to finally live as young men would in a big city. They attended the local festivities dotting the city, partaking in the carnival, the parades, and even flirting with the young girls from the local Italian school. But for them, this was only a momentary distraction from their goals and their fate. To them, 
they were just as much a part of their explosions as the actual bombs were. To not die would simply have been cowardly. With one final night together, they greeted each other farewell, and they were ready to launch their attack. Nije ne barame slava. Dosta ako jeden den ljudje to ne razberat. I na mesto spomenik neka tamu kade što će zaginjeme. Ni ostavat jeden cvet. Jeden cvet? Jeden cvet so boja na srce to. S Bogom, drugari. Posljednja va čaša da neja pijeme za naša ta smrt. Za neja. Za Makedonije. Majčice. Sakav me samo jedno. Da bide me tvoji dobri sinovi. Ako ne uspeav me, prosti. Ke dojda te den den, podobri od nas. On the morning of April 28th, Pavel Shatev calmly boards the French ship Guadalquivir. He's holding a suitcase packed full of dynamite. And as soon as the ship leaves port, he detonates it. He sets the entire ship ablaze. Now, miraculously, all the passengers, himself included, managed to escape unharmed. But as for the ship, well, it was damaged beyond repair. A complete and total loss. That same evening, Dmitry Mitchev, alongside Ilya Turchkov and Milan Arsov, strike the main railway line between Salonika and Istanbul with dynamite. They damage a locomotive as well as a passing train car without harming any of the passengers as well. The next day, the 29th, begins out deceptively calm. However, this is only a calm before the storm. That same evening is later rocked with explosions when Kostadin Kirkov ignites the main gas and water line of the city. Salonika is now plunged into darkness. And this is the sign for the other conspirators to not only take their places, but begin their attacks. As such, Dmitry Mitchev and Ilya Trishkov set out to explode the main gas reservoir of the city, inflicting further harm. However, a local night patrolman with a pistol catches them and they're forced to flee the scene. They do manage to escape and they're throwing bombs left and right until they reach their apartment safe haven. And from their apartment window, they engage the Ottomans in a shootout where they throw more than 60 bombs at them. Before the night is through, both men are ultimately killed. At the same time, in a different part of the city, the leader of the group, Orce Popirdanov, ignites the fuse in the tunnel underneath the Ottoman bank and blasts it to kingdom come. He too manages to escape to his apartment where he engages the Ottoman soldiers outside his window in a three hour long shootout. However, after all the bullets and ammo is depleted, he too meets his end and he is killed. And the next day, when the Ottoman soldiers finally entered his room to remove his body, an Ottoman soldier, infuriated at what he had done, wanted to take his body, mutilate it, and drag it through the streets of Salonika. However, a senior Ottoman soldier not only stopped him, but scolded him. He said, let this man be an example to all of you of how you should sacrifice yourself and die for your country. Meanwhile, Milan Arsov alongside Georgi Bogdanov throw bombs into the Alhambra Cafe in an open air theater, while at the same time Vladimir Pingo tries to set fire to the Bosniak Inn. He is killed in action, while other men manage to escape. And finally, on the last night of the attacks, a sharply dressed Kostadin Kirikov, complete with a top hat and a dinner jacket, strolls into the main post office of Salonika. He too is carrying a bomb, and as he is attempting to detonate it, he is shot at point-blank range by an Ottoman soldier. He is killed, and the mission goes on uncompleted. However, at the same time, another conspirator is about to launch his attack, Svetko Trajkov. 
man old enough to be most the boy's father, but who caught their infectious love for Macedonia, is about to catch up to the carriage of the Vali of Salonika to try to assassinate him. However, he is caught before he is able to do so. Instead of surrendering at the face of the Ottoman army, he calmly takes out a grenade, detonates it, and blows himself to pieces in front of the Ottoman soldiers. You're now undoubtedly sitting there asking yourself, what was the outcome of their brave and heroic deaths? Were they successful? Did they meet their goals? Well, I hate to break it to you folks, but absolutely not. The outcome of their actions was, in one word, chaos. The Ottoman army soon took to collectively punishing the entire population of Salonika for the explosions. Not just this, but many Macedonians were mowed down in a fit of retaliatory rage from Bitola all the way up to Vilas, the city most of the conspirators came from. Entire villages were burned and raised to the ground, and many innocent Macedonians who had absolutely no knowledge of the attacks, much less having any hand in the planning or the execution of them, ended up paying with their lives for the actions of the Gamiji. And as for the civilized West that they were trying to shock into coming to help Macedonia finally, well, they were shocked. They were shocked by the level of violence that they had committed, and the level of violence that soon broke out as a direct result of their explosions. So, in a way, folks, if you're trying to get the French to come and help you, maybe you shouldn't blow up their ships. May not be the best way. Sure, some of the Westerners were a little bit moved by the heroic valor of their deaths and the desperation they must have felt to want to die so young, but for the most part, the status quo remained unchanged. Nobody came from Macedonia's help. She was left by herself once more, and we all know how that ended up. So given all this, given all the countless and needless deaths that the Gamiji indirectly and directly caused, why do we still celebrate them? Why do we still have monuments to them? Why do we still have songs about them, movies about them? Why do we still call them Nashi Makedonski Yunatsi, given all this? Well, let me put it to you this way. Gotze Delchev, like many of you now, could not support nor condone any of the actions nor the tactics of the Gimiji. But, at the end of the day, he still had a soft spot for them. Because he saw them for what they were. Young, selfless idealists with the pure hearts of children who were willing to lay down, sacrifice their own youthful and innocent lives for their people, for their independence, for their salvation. Sure, their minds may not have been in the right place. After all, they were children. But you can't sit there and tell me that their hearts were not in the right place when I don't see one-tenth of that love of Macedonia and her people alive anywhere in Macedonia or the diaspora. And just remember folks, their motto was Se Archime za Macedonia. We waste away for Macedonia. We give up everything for Macedonia. And truly, every degree of mind and spirit these 18, 21 year olds possessed was dedicated to the cause of service to Macedonia and her enslaved people. So just remember that.